little glitch. I'm just trying to um, share my screen with you. Now it's visible, Doctor. We can see your screen. Yeah, but I'm not able to see my screen myself. One second. I'm sorry for the tech. So, uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, I will request you to uh, please forward the slide when I say, uh, because I'm not able to share it myself. So, um, so today's topic is conjunctivitis, which is a fairly common uh, clinical condition that all of you will see in your clinical practice. So uh, we will discuss about conjunctivitis in a little bit of detail. Uh, next slide, please. So for today's topic, uh, the agenda will be that we'll discuss a little bit about the anatomy of conjunctiva. Uh, we'll discuss about the various, uh, various types and uh, the definition of conjunctivitis, why it is a big deal, what is the socioeconomic importance of conjunctivitis. Uh, we will also try to learn various important etiologies and their management. And then at the end, we will try to discuss certain conditions which are called as masqueraders because they mimic as conjunctivitis, but they are not conjunctivitis. So uh, let's begin the uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So uh, here is a schematic diagram of conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is the um, conjunctiva is a very thin and uh, translucent layer which covers the ocular surface. And uh, it can be divided into two parts, bulbar conjunctiva and palpebral conjunctiva. Bulbar conjunctiva basically spreads from the uh, edge of the cornea to the visible sclera. Palpebral conjunctiva is the part of the conjunctiva which is the inner lining of the back surface of eyelids. And where these two parts meet, that recess is called as fornix of conjunctiva. Fornix is the part where most of the uh, lacrimal and accessory lacrimal glands open into the cul de sac. The, uh, below the epithelium of conjunctiva lies the stroma, which is a very loose mixed connective tissue uh, and full of lymphatic follicles, uh, lymphatic channels, immune mediated cells, and uh, blood vessels. Why this is important, we will see in the next slide. Next slide, please. So what is the definition of conjunctiva? Conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis is also uh, known as uh, pink eye and uh, it can be defined as the inflammation of conjunctiva which is characterized by dilatation of the conjunctival vessels which results in hyperemia that means redness and edema of the conjunctiva which is also called as chemosis of conjunctiva. Typically it is associated with some sort of discharge which can be serous, mucus, mucopurulent, purulent or hyperpurulent. Now uh, on the right side you can see two uh, pictures. One is the depiction of follicles and second is papillae. Now follicles and papillae are the uh, inflammatory response of conjunctivitis and uh, the appearance of conjunctivitis uh, decides, the etiology of conjunctivitis decides whether it will be predominantly a follicular mediated reaction or papillary mediated reaction. Mostly in viral conjunctivitis, we see follicles more commonly than papillae, whereas in bacterial and allergic conjunctivitis, papillary response is a more common way of uh, type of uh, response that is seen. 
Next, please. So what is the big deal? Why uh, we are worried about the socioeconomic impact of conjunctivitis? So the data that I'm going to present comes from, a, from an article which was published in uh, Clinical Journal of Ophthalmology in 2020. Uh, this study was basically done on uh, to estimate the indirect and direct cost of conjunctivitis, especially infective conjunctivitis in people who are covered by insurance. So the data is basically given by the insurance companies. So according to this data, um, it was shown that conjunctivitis affects more than 6 million people in the United States annually, which is a very big number. And hence, it is important to understand the various uh, phenotypes of conjunctivitis. Approximately 1% of all primary care office visits in the United States are related to conjunctivitis. That means uh, of all the patients that are going to the primary care in, uh, in the United States, 1% of all these patients are conjunctivitis patients. Now, 1% may look a very small number, but when you look about, when you talk about the entire spectrum of all human diseases, it's a very big number. So based on the data, it was estimated that the direct cost of conjunctivitis is approximately 800 million US dollars annually. Now uh, we can understand the uh, impact of this thing. And uh, um, the direct and indirect cost cumulatively crosses 1 billion. Now it's a very huge number to insurance companies and the uh, providers to uh, manage. Please, uh, next slide, please. So with this background, now we understand why it is important for all of us to know about conjunctivitis so that we can uh, treat uh, all the patients effectively in a uh, very time efficient and cost effective manner. Conjunctivitis can be divided into two different types. Uh, primarily, it is it can be infective or non-infective. Infective conjunctivitis can be because of virus or bacteria and non-infective uh, conjunctivitis can be because of allergies or maybe because of some toxic substances, trauma, foreign body, uh, autoimmune mediated or cicatricial conjunctivitis. We will discuss about these uh, types a little bit in detail in the coming few slides. It can also be divided into acute and chronic type or primary and secondary type, where primary is uh, the uh, independent disease entity and secondary is secondary to some systemic disease like uh, Steven Johnson syndrome or some other uh, systemic illnesses. Next, please. Coming to the viral conjunctivitis, which is most common type of all types of conjunctivitis. Hence, it is very important for all of you to identify it uh, in your clinic whenever the patient uh, comes to you uh, because this is very uh, often wrongly diagnosed and overly treated condition. So uh, how you will identify viral conjunctivitis by uh, looking at the clinical symptoms and signs. Uh, patients would most likely give a history of watery discharge, itching in the eyes, and of course the eye will be congested with follicular type of reaction as we discussed earlier. This condition is more commonly seen in summers. And the most common cause of this uh, conjunctivitis is adenovirus. 80% 80 of the cases are because of adenovirus. One to uh, four to five percent of the cases are because of herpes simplex virus. This uh, virus also creates a, a similar kind of picture, but the additional feature is vesicular lesions around the lids. And hence, you can differentiate between uh, herpes simplex and adenovirus. Also, herpes simplex virus conjunctivitis uh, in many cases are unilateral. Coming to the herpes zoster, herpes zoster is also called as shingles. And uh, it basically affects the dermatome or the skin of the patient, but eye involvement is very, very frequent if the first and the second branch of the trigeminal nerve, which serves the upper and middle part of the face, is involved. Also, Hutchinson sign, whenever it is present, the likelihood of uh, ocular involvement, the corneal involvement is very, very high. You can see the, the picture in, uh, below uh, on the right side, where you can see a vesicle at the tip of the nose. So whenever there's a vesicle at the tip of the nose of the patient, this uh, is a positive Hutchinson sign, and it suggests that the patient's eye will also be involved. This is a very important sign. I hope all of you should remember this. Next, please.
So how do you manage viral conjunctivitis patients? Now, sign and symptoms can be misleading. So if you rely completely on sign and symptoms, you may misdiagnose this patient as something else. So to reduce the, um, uh, the wrong diagnosis, the probability of wrong diagnosis, and to expedite the treatment, rapid antigen tests are available, which are highly sensitive and specific for the diagnosis of uh, viral conjunctivitis patients. Now, what is the advantage of uh, doing these tests is, first of all, the diagnosis will be readily available to you. Second, you will not diagnose these patients by mistake as a bacterial conjunctivitis patients because uh, if you diagnose the patient as bacterial conjunctivitis, you tend to start antibiotics. So by doing these tests, when you can uh, 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 identify the etiology with uh, surety, you basically can avoid unnecessary use of antibiotics, which may be a, a public health burden and can lead to uh, resistance to these antibiotics later on. The most important, the common uh, management strategy for all conjunctivitis patients, whether it is bacterial or viruses, to maintain a very good hygiene, to not rub the eyes, to not touch the eyes, and to wash your high, uh, hands and uh, sanitize them regularly, so that by mistake, if you have touched something else, others will not come in contact with the virus. Um, mostly treatment is symptomatic and cold compresses sometimes are enough to treat most of the cases of viral conjunctivitis. But, next please. In some special cases, you need to treat uh, adenoviral cases. Now, there are two clinical scenarios where you need to use steroids to use adenovirus. Uh, antiviral medications in form of eye drops, eye ointments or uh, antiviral tablets are not effective in adenovirus cases. So the first clinical picture where you can see a membrane in the lower con uh, conjunctival uh, fornix, this is called as pseudomembranous conjunctivitis. And the second picture below is called as uh, keratoconjunctivitis, where you can see some uh, multiple pinhead size of epithelial infiltrates. Now, these are the two complications of adenoviral conjunctivitis where you need to use topical steroids so that you can reduce the inflammation and uh, achieve the uh, cure rapidly. In case of herpes simplex, uh, you need to use systemic and topical antivirals. And uh, the systemic and topical antiviral medications like acyclovir and gancyclovir are very effective in herpes simplex conjunctivitis. So if you use them, it will definitely cut short the duration of conjunctivitis. And in herpes zoster, uh, whenever you see uh, the dermatological involvement, you need to use systemic antiviral tablets to use uh, to, con uh, to control the dermatological manifestations. But a very important thing is that the ocular manifestations, whenever it is present, they are inflammatory in nature. They are not infective. So if you use topical antiviral medications for herpes zoster, uh, it will not achieve any remission or cure. So topical steroids and systemic antiviral is the treatment for herpes zoster, which is slightly different from herpes simplex. We need to uh, remember this thing. Next, please. Now coming to the second most important category of conjunctivitis, uh, bacterial conjunctivitis are the second most common cause of conjunctivitis overall. And uh, in childhood, it is the most common cause of conjunctivitis. Kids who go to nurseries and schools, they uh, often come back home with red eyes and uh, watery and discharge. And uh, most of the cases are conjunctivitis because of bacteria. The most common bacteria which can cause bacterial conjunctivitis are the same bacteria which are present on your body surface as commensals, like Staph aureus, Staph uh, epidermidis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, H. influenzae, and Moraxella. Sometimes the conjunctivitis due to bacteria can also be because of gonorrhea and chlamydia, which are uh, sexually uh, transmitted disease. And uh, most of the uncomplicated cases, they uh, resolve in one to two weeks. Next, please. Now, what are the risk factors of bacterial conjunctivitis? Close contacts, of course, uh, as true in any uh, form of conjunctivitis, uh, close contact with a patient who already has conjunctivitis can uh, cause a risk factor, can become a risk factor for you to get the conjunctivitis. So hygiene is very important. You should always uh, maintain a safe distance from the patients. Uh, sometimes abnormal proliferation of the natural flora, as we discussed, the bacteria which are already present on your ocular surface, if the, the bacterial colony count increases, the chances of infection also increases. 
contaminated hands and for mites can transmit the disease. Also, dry eye patients are more prone to have conjunctivitis. Uh, and in some cases, when the patient is immunocompromised, even the normal flora which is present on the uh, body surface can become pathogenic and cause conjunctivitis. Next, please. So how do you diagnose uh, bacterial conjunctivitis? Many studies fail to show that, uh, uh, that by looking at the presence or absence of discharge or uh, type of discharge, you can identify a particular etiology because that is misleading in many cases. So there's a triad of three signs. If these three signs are present, your case uh, has a very strong prob probability of being bacterial conjunctivitis or bacterial in origin. What are these three signs? First, bilateral mattering of the eyelids. That means when the patient wakes up in the morning, he finds his eyelids are sticky and matted together and patient finds it difficult to open the eyes. Second, lack of itching is a very, very important uh, sign because itching is a paramount, it is a hall hallmark of uh, allergic and viral conjunctivitis. So lack of itching, bilateral matting of eyelids and no history of previous conjunctivitis. If these three things are present, your case is most likely because of bacteria. Next, please. Now, coming to the management of bacterial conjunctivitis. Again, as we discussed, uncomplicated cases are self-resolving. It takes one to two weeks time for cases to uh, resolve all by own. Uh, so when do you need culture? When do you need uh, microbiological evidence? So uh, culture is uh, done only in cases which are not responding. They are... Uh, uh, producing hyperpurulent conjunctivitis, as in like there's a copious amount of uh, discharge being produced. And when you suspect chlamydia, uh, how would you suspect chlamydia? Chlamydia is, uh, in most of the cases, a sexually transmitted disease. So if the partner is also showing some symptoms of um, infection, and uh, there's a huge amount of watery discharge, chlamydia is known to cause watery discharge, then you should suspect uh, uh, chlamydia and in that case you need to culture it. Why culture is important in these cases? We'll discuss later on. So as we discussed, 60% of the cases are self-limiting and rest of the cases can be used, uh, can be treated by using topical antibiotics. The advantage of topical antibiotic is it reduces the duration and achieves the cure very uh, rapidly if the pathogen is uh, sensitive to the antibiotic. Now in special cases uh, like gonorrhea and chlamydia, when uh, systemically also some symptoms and signs are present, uh, we need to treat these patients not only with topical, but also with systemic antibiotics like uh, intramuscular, intramuscular safe tracks on. Next, please. So that's uh, about the infective conjunctivitis, the most common types of infective conjunctivitis. Now coming to the non-infective conjunctivitis, the most common cause of non-infective conjunctivitis is allergic conjunctivitis. And it makes almost about 40% of the cases of total conjunctivitis. Uh, more commonly seen in seasons like spring and summer, and especially when the weathers are changing, people who are prone to get allergies, they show signs of uh, allergic conjunctivitis a lot. Uh, the thing is, it's a very mild form of conjunctivitis. It doesn't produce a lot of sticky, gluey discharge or uh, intense uh, congestion. So only 10% of these patients seek medical care. Now, uh, there are various types of allergic conjunctivitis. The most common type is seasonal conjunctivitis, as we discussed. It becomes apparent only during the particular seasons. But then there are some very severe form of uh, uh, allergic conjunctivitis like uh, atopic and vernal keratoconjunctivitis. Now, they are, in, uh, they are a, a huge topic in itself to be discussed separately, but uh, we will just touch upon like what all it can uh, do. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as we know, itching is the most common symptom of any allergy, whether it is in eye or in nose or on the skin. Whenever you have uh, itching, that suggests that you have some sort of allergy going on. Um, now, the allergic conjunctivitis can show both papillary and follicular reaction, but the papillary reaction is very, very common uh, in comparison to follicle reaction. Papillaries can be small, it can be cobblestone, or they can be giant papillae, particularly on the upper tarsal conjunctiva, causing a lot of symptoms and signs to the patient. Follicular reaction is most commonly seen in 
atopic keratoconjunctivitis. Uh, also, patients who have chronic uh, allergic conjunctivitis, their conjunctiva is muddy in color. That's because of the uh, uh, proliferation of the pigment cells in the conjunctiva. In extreme cases like VKC and AKC, as we discussed, can lead to limbal hypertrophy. That means at the limbus, which is the junction of conjunctiva and cornea, you see hypertrophied uh, mass. And if it remains uh, active for a very long time, can lead to limbal stem cell deficiency. Now, limbal stem cell deficiency is a very serious condition. That's why I told you like, you know, AKC and VKC uh, have a lot of implication on the final visual outcome of the patient. So we need to cure these patients very effectively and early in the course of disease. How do you control them? The simple and the seasonal cases can be controlled by just using topical and systemic antihistaminic drops and tablets. Whereas in AKC and VKC, you need to use some sort of immunotherapy, which uh, is basically used in form of topical or systemic cyclosporine. Next, please. So now we have understood like various uh, more common form of conjunctivitis, uh, bacterial, viral, and allergic. Uh, apart from these uh, types of conjunctivitis, there are so many other types of conjunctivitis also uh, seen. But because they are not very common, it's beyond the scope of this uh, lecture. So maybe uh, if you have any query, you can write mail to us or uh, directly contact us. We can uh, discuss these things separately in detail. So uh, now the more important thing for primary care physicians or uh, all the optometrists, because when you will run your clinics, you are the first person who will come in contact with all conjunctivitis patients. So when to make a judicious referral is very important. So you need to understand that any patient who is complaining of vision loss along with conjunctivitis is in pain, moderate to severe grade pain, have severe discharge, already has a corneal involvement in form of some ulcer or uh, infiltrate, not responding to the treatment that you are already giving to the patient, showing a recurrent nature of uh, inflammation, has a history of herpes simplex virus in the past, is a contact lens wearer and now has conjunctivitis, or someone who needs steroid eye drops or has a lot of photophobia. These are all the signs and symptoms. Whenever you come across these things, please refer your patients immediately to the ophthalmologist because these uh, signs may be harbinger of imminent corneal perforation, corneal ulcer, and patient is at the risk of losing the eyesight. So this is the most common, uh, most important message that I want to convey by uh, uh, talking about the conjunctivitis. Next, please. Now, uh, we are coming to the uh, the final and the more uh, very interesting part of the presentation, uh, masqueraders. What are masqueraders? Masqueraders are the disease entities which basically disguise as conjunctivitis, but they are not conjunctivitis. And uh, they are wrongly diagnosed as conjunctivitis and treated for conjunctivitis, which leads to delaying their proper diagnosis and treatment. And in some cases, it can be vision threatening as well as sight threatening. Now, how, how to diagnose masqueraders? How to differentiate masqueraders? The only thing is you need to have a very high degree of suspicion. You need to always rethink why this patient has an atypical presentation. Does this patient also has a systemic involvement? Why is not responding to my treatment? Anything abnormal you notice, just have a, 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 a open mind to think out of the box that this patient may require an urgent referral and uh, because by doing that we can actually save the site for the patient next please yeah so now i'm going to discuss few cases with you and i'll show you some pictures and videos and you will see yourself that the patient will come across as if he's a simple case of conjunctivitis sometimes viral sometimes uh, allergic but they are actually something else so this is my first case. Uh, it was a 27-year-old male patient who presented to us with the complaints of pain, redness, and watering in the left eye for three months. The right eye was uh, essentially asymptomatic or was showing a very mild congestion. It was a left eye which was actually showing congestion, redness, and watering. So patient, when we, he presented to us, he was already on treatment with topical oloparadine and a low dose uh, steroids off and on. Next, please. 
Now here are uh, two short videos. Can you just, yeah. So you can see the right eye is essentially normal, not showing much of congestion or uh, any uh, sign of conjunctivitis. But if you look at the left eye, can you just play the video on the left? Can you just click, yeah. So now you can see in the left eye, uh, not only patient has congestion, dilated blood vessels are there, but also if you look at the cornea carefully, there is a scar, there's a white opacity on the conjunctive, uh, on the cornea. So what is it? Is it conjunctivitis? Or something else. Uh, next, please. So we had a degree of suspicion. So we asked patient, we probed him, we probed the uh, history further. And he revealed that he had a similar kind of irritation about three months back in the left eye. So uh, he went to various uh, practitioners and various doctors diagnosed him with various diagnoses. Ultimately, he used antibacterials, antifungals, antivirals, all as a cocktail for eight weeks. And ultimately, someone started anti-allergic drops also. So basically, patient received every possible type of medications available. And he used it for a good two months. Next, please. So the important thing to understand here is that patient did not have conjunctivitis. Patient just had toxic medicamentosa. Now, it is a condition which basically uh, is seen in patients who overtreat themselves when uh, these strong medications are used for a very long period, uh, prolonged period of time. It leads to irritation of the uh, conjunctival cul-de-sac, especially follicles are seen in the lower conjunctiva, as you can see in the picture uh, on the right side. And if this inflammation is not treated uh, timely, it can actually affect these limbal stem cells. And when the stem cells are damaged, the barrier between the cornea and conjunctiva is lost and the conjunctiva grows or it starts to grow on the cornea. And that's uh, what actually led to a white scar in the cornea. So basically, this patient had just conjecta, uh, just uh, toxic medicamentosa, which led to stem cell deficiency, leading to corneal opacity. And if not treated or controlled in time, it can actually lead to a full uh, limbal stem cell deficiency requiring limbal stem cell transplantation. Next, please. So why it happens? Why uh, medicamentosa happens? Because, you know, sometimes patients use a lot of medications by themselves or if they are wrongly diagnosed, they uh, use a lot of medications together. Initially, they might be helped. They might, because if you are using anti-allergic, of course, your symptoms will go down. If you are using lubricants, of course, you will feel better. If you are using topical steroid by mistake, of course, your congestion will go down initially. But because you feel initial uh, improvement in the symptom, you tend to continue these medications for more than required. And then that leads to damage. And that also leads to uh, the uh, delayed diagnosis for the uh, actual problem. So never over treat your patients. Please examine them carefully, delve into the history properly, examine them properly, and then only start treatment. And then make sure that when you start the treatment, you instruct the patient very, very carefully about the duration of the treatment. Never let them overuse the medications. Next, please. So another interesting case, it's a, a patient who was a 68-year-old lady who uh, underwent left eye cataract surgeries three months back. Everything went well, uh, no problem. Patient uh, was very happy with the post-op vision. And... Uh, after one month, when we normally stop the medications, patient came back with the congestion and redness in the eyes. So she was again restarted on topical steroids and non-steroidal eye drops. And she kept on using it for two months. And uh, the redness, the congestion did not stop, did not reduce. And uh, that's when patient was actually re-examined again. And uh, please, next slide. So what did we find on the examination? we found that there are some mucosal folds. We are more apparent in the lower picture. If you can see, there are some folds, uh, semi-lunar folds, which are rising from the lower fornix and going uh, towards the limbus and uh, on either side. 
So these folds are submucosal fibrosis, which is very typical of uh, a condition called as ocular cicatricial pemphigoid. Now, ocul ocular cicatricial pemphigoid is a condition which is basically immune mediated, and it is very commonly seen in an old lady of this age. Uh, patients who are 60 years or aged in uh, uh, or more aged, they are more prone to have uh, OCP. Basically, it's a genetically uh, determined disease. Those who are genetically predisposed to OCP, whenever there is an environmental trigger, in this case, the trigger was surgery. We did not know that patient has uh, a genetic predisposition for um, OCP. And we took it as a normal case. Surgery went well. Nothing happened to patient. But actually, the event of surgery was the trauma to the patient. And this trauma actually triggered the immune reaction. And it led to uh, formation of this uh, mucosal folds and uh, a persistent inflammation. Now, this is a very, very important condition. It can be blinding in most of the cases. Uh, please, next slide. So how do you diagnose this patient? So whenever you see this kind of inflammation, now you can see the picture, which is more clear. You can see folds, vertical folds, rising from the lower fornix, going all the way up to the upper fornix. Now, you need to take biopsy from these involved areas and you need to do immunofluorescent assays. So basically, antibodies are seen against uh, the basement membrane of conjunctival epithelium. And when you see them, this is a sure shot diagnosis of OCP. Now, OCP needs a systemic immunosuppression because if you don't do that, it can lead to extreme dryness of the eyes because all the eye glands, all the lacrimal glands, mucus secreting goblet cells will be consumed by the process of inflammation and patient will be left behind with a very, very dry surface and uh, which is not compatible with vision uh, as is uh, obvious. So uh, you need to prevent the cicatrization or the scarring of the conjunctiva by uh, giving systemic immunosuppression because otherwise it can lead to, as I told you, uh, the dryness, entropion, trichiasis, and uh, corneal scarring. Next, please. Case number three, a 32-year-old female. She was HIV positive and uh, she presented to us with gritty and watery red eyes and she had extreme photophobia. And on presentation, she was taking anti-allergic drop as given by someone, uh, but there was no relief, of course. Now, what is the reason? Uh, if you... If you Carefully check these patients. In this patient, we found a very interesting finding. Can you please go to the next slide? On ocular examination, as you can see, the upper lid and the lower lid, the inner margin of the eyelid is very, very dry and it's scaly. You can see some deposit, a whitish deposit at the edge of the lid margins. So what is that deposit? That's keratin. Keratin is a condition, a keratin is a protein which is overexpressed in certain uh, inflammatory conditions. And uh, you can also see the middle picture showing stippled appearance of cornea, where you can see a lot of SPKs and the uh, dry spots on the cornea. The dryness can also be seen on the neighboring conjunctiva. If you look carefully, you can see some staining on the conjunctiva as well. So you have uh, keratin deposits with extreme dryness uh, on the ocular surface. What is this condition? Next, please. This condition was Steven Johnson syndrome. Why Steven Johnson syndrome? Because patient was HIV positive and the treating physician started her on highly active antiretroviral therapy. And one of the component of antiretroviral therapy is nevirapine. Nevirapine is known to cause um, Steven Johnson syndrome. So what Steven Johnson syndrome normally is, it's, uh, it's a T-cell mediated delayed hypersensitivity reaction and it is seen with many different types of uh, drugs like penicillin or allopurinol or uh, as we discussed uh, antiretroviral therapy what happens is that your body fails to clear the active metabolites of uh, the the drug the actual drug and these active metabolites they stay in the system for very long and then ultimately they lead to delayed hypersensitivity reaction, which leads to intractable uh, inflammation on the ocular surface. Now, Steven-Johnson syndrome 
is again a very very difficult condition to uh, manage you can't cure it you can only control it and if it is not controlled properly by using systemic uh, steroids and systemic anti uh, immunosuppressants then it can lead to extreme dryness and sometimes perforation and loss of vision uh, this is such a unforgiving condition that even corneal transplantation cannot save patient's vision and you need to resort to the extreme uh, measures of keratoprosthesis or artificial cornea next please case number 4 again presented and treated as conjunctivitis but was not conjunctivitis 54 year old female uh, came with a history of watering from both the eyes and treated as dry eyes and ocular allergy and she was having a temporary relief with the therapy but not completely uh, happy next please so uh this picture is uh I'm I'm sorry with the poor quality of the picture, but if you look carefully at the lower limbus, just concentric to the limbus, there's a, a line which actually is taking up the fluorescent stain, and this line is running across the lower half of the cornea, and uh, just adjacent to that is a lot of dry spots or SPKs in the cornea. So what is this line? This is nothing but an extra fold of conjunctiva which is folded upon itself itself, and basically riding over the cornea beyond limbus so this condition is called as conjunctivo callosus that means extra skin now it is not conjunctivitis it is just physically extra conjunctiva or extra skin which is folding on itself and causing a uh, pooling of the uh, inflammatory tears and leading to all these signs that you are seeing right now the treatment is very simple it cannot be cured by drops it cannot be cured by uh antibiotics or steroids or lubricants or whatever you need to excise this extra conjunctival fold and that is the only cure of this disease but this poor lady was being treated for conjunctivitis for very long time next please next please so fifth case a 26 year old male came with recurrent redness and watering and was being treated elsewhere with multiple eye drops in form of antibiotics and lubricants and anti uh, uh, allergics now next slide please when you look at this clinical picture what do you think it looks like a, a perfect case of conjunctivitis there are a lot of dry, uh, there's a lot of congestion the dilated blood vessels are there of course mucoid discharge is not there but sometimes it can be just a watery discharge but this is not conjunctivitis if you look at this clinical picture uh, very very um, uh, astutely or uh, in detail you will see that these vessels are not superficial vessels they are deeper vessels in conjunctivitis what you see is congestion of superficial conjunctival vessels but in this condition the uh, vessels are radiating uh, away from the limbus and they are deeper in nature you can also see a very diffuse kind of a deeper or dull kind of congestion rather than a very bright congestion now this condition is not conjunctivitis but it was a recurrent episcleritis now if you treat episcleritis patient with anti allergic drops or lubricants or antibiotics patient is never going to respond the treatment of choice of this patient this condition is topical steroids and if it turns or develops into scleritis then systemic steroids next please next please now uh, coming to the last case and uh, this is again a 40, 42 year old male patient who had a history of allergy for 8 years he was always on and off on topical steroid therapy he also underwent a cataract surgery 2 years ago when this presentation he actually presented with uh, congestion in the left eye redness in the left eye and was diagnosed as recurrent allergic eye disease because he had a history of allergy in the past so uh next slide please so this patient presented to us with this clinical picture now you can see that there is a mild congestion but the blood vessels are basically encroaching from the cornea over to the uh, crossing over the limbus and uh, coming on the cornea so you can see conjunctival vessels crossing over limbus and coming to the cornea with lot of uh, opacity or scarring in the upper part now this may seem like 
a similar picture of uh, limbal stem cell deficiency as we discussed in the first case, but this is not so. The thick vessels which are supplying this uh, flattened lesion, which is basically involving the upper half of the cornea, is not uh, conjunctival vessels. They are feeder vessels, and this condition is diagnosed as ocular surface squamous neoplasia, which is a surface cancer, and it has to be excised in toto, and uh, otherwise it has a tendency to recur. It can be cured by topical mitomycin or uh, interferon eye drops, as well as uh, in extreme cases when the sclera is involved, it has to be excised and the graft has to be placed. So this was a case of, next please. This was a case of uh, ocular uh, surface squamous neoplasia. So you saw, I mean, uh, you know how these conditions can easily mimic conjunctivitis and uh, avoid detection being wrongly treated as uh, conjunctivitis, which delays uh, the treatment, which can be life-threatening in some cases and uh, site threatening also in most of the cases. So the important thing is, next please. So the important thing is you need to understand both the things. You need to know the signs and symptoms of common conditions like viral conjunctivitis, bacterial conjunctivitis, allergic conjunctivitis, and also have a higher degree of suspicion whenever you see a, a very atypical case, you need to know, you need to think that it can be something else. So proper attention to the history, a careful eye examination. Uh, you need to look for systemic association whether the patient has anything else as well in the body. Uh, these basically can make sure that you can pick up your diagnosis correctly and timely. You know, Viral cases mostly are self-limiting. We treat only when you see either a membrane or you see um, uh, uh, the uh, the epithelial infiltrates or you see a Hutchinson sign or herpes uh, viral infections. Bacterial conditions, again, mostly they are self-limiting, but if you use broad-spectrum antibiotics, you can reduce the duration of the disease process. And early and appropriate referral is the key. This is the message that I want to convey today that please have all these signs and symptoms in your mind, which will help you in diagnosing your cases timely in a correct manner. And early referral uh, can save patient's eye and uh, sometimes patient's life. Thank you so much. The house is open. If anyone has any question, you are free to ask. Thank you, Dr. Anurag, for that insightful presentation on conjunctivitis. Now we'll move on to the Q&A session. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat, and we'll address them one by one. So, Doctor, my first question for you. Can we prescribe eye drops that contain cortisone to relieve the symptoms of viral conjunctivitis? See, uh, if you go by the uh, book bookish explanation or the textbook explanation, I would say no. Uh, steroids are not required for all viral conjunctivitis patients. It should be given only to patients who have either keratitis in form of filtrates in the cornea, those white dots which I showed you in the picture, or patient has a lot of uh, membrane deposits. Of course, before starting steroids, you need to remove the membrane and then only you can start the steroid drops. But for most of the cases, uh, we don't need to. But why we start steroids? I mean, we do give steroids to patients who do not have infiltrates and uh, membranes because you want to cut short the misery for the patient. Steroids will definitely reduce the inflammation and uh, sometimes they shorten the duration also. But the evidence in the literature is controversial. Um, some people say that in uncomplicated case of adenoviral, if you start topical steroids, you can basically um, prolong the duration because it avoids uh, remission. It allows the viral uh, particles to proliferate more. But what we have seen in the clinical practice is that uh, if topical steroids are started uh, in early in the course of uh, conjunctivitis, we can actually cut short the duration. So your answer is yes. 
Okay, so my next, next question for you, are the red eyes that occur with flu symptoms are also a form of conjunctivitis? Can you please come again? Are the red eyes that occur, occur with flu symptoms are also a form of conjunctivitis? Yes, yes, indeed they are. So uh, adenoviral conjunctivitis is basically because of adenoviral infection, which is one of the most common cause of normal common flu. Now, flu can actually cause two different types of presentation. One is a very serious one, that is keratoconjunctivitis, where you see uh, corneal infiltrates. But in many other cases, it just causes a very high-grade fever, um, tonsillitis, sore throat, and uh, congestion in both the eyes. So this is called as a pharyngoconjunctival fever, which is a type of uh, adenoviral infection. And uh, yes, so the red dyes that you see in patients of flu is conjunctivitis, b to virus, yes. Okay, thank you, doctor. So my third question for you, what happens if the bacterial conjunctivitis is left untreated? So uh, bacterial conjunctivitis um, in most of the cases are self-limiting, as I said, but uh, in case of certain uh, bacteria like Neisseria, Gonorrhea, and uh, Haemophilus influenzae and Listeria, uh, bacteria actually can penetrate your cornea, intact cornea as well, and it can lead to uh, melting of the cornea and perforation. Similarly, if the uh, infection is very severe, uh, if it is not treated timely, uh, conjunctivitis can convert into keratitis in no time and uh, it can lead to corneal perforation real quick. So bacterial con uh, uh, conjunctivitis, if you see, is not responding to treatment or having a lot of uh, discharge. Patient has photophobia, you see any corneal involvement, you have to immediately start antibiotics and refer the patient. Okay, thank you, doctor. I have one more question for you. If 60% yep. of bacterial conjunctivitis are self-limiting, when yes. should I start worrying and use some medication? So as I uh, explained previously that if uh, the patient is not showing the sign of recovery, uh, even after a few days, um, see, the, the recommendation is that uh, in actually in the US, uh, they assume that every conjunctivitis is bacterial conjunctivitis unless proved otherwise, because they don't want to, uh, uh, you know, want the employees to miss their work days. They don't want the kids to miss their school days. So even if it is allergic conjunctivitis, the guidelines there is that to start at least a broad spectrum antibiotic, which uh, can take care of the conjunctivitis real quick. Now, if you don't uh, treat them, 60% of the cases will all, uh, they will eventually, they will resolve automatically, like without doing anything. But uh, if you start uh, antibiotic uh, treatment or topical antibiotics, you can actually cut short that duration. So normally it would take one to two weeks. If you start antibiotics, they will respond in three to five days. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you, doctor. Uh, I have one more question for you. Are there any mm -hmm. specific precautions individuals with conjunctivitis should take during different seasons or times of the year? Yes, uh, so allergic conjunctivitis has a seasonal variation, particularly. Viral conjunctivitis also has a tendency to occur more during summers. So uh, whenever there's a flu season, uh, those who are prone to get flus recurrently should take flu shots. Uh, whenever they have conjunctivitis already, they should uh, maintain a highest level of hygiene where uh, uh, you can start by not touching your eyes, uh, washing your hands very regularly, using soap and uh, uh, sanitizers. Uh, also, all your personal belongings like your pillow cover, your bed sheet, your towels, everything should be separate. Uh, close contacts in form of hugs and kisses should be avoided. And uh, highest level of separation has to be maintained. It's not like uh, the isolation or the uh, you know quarantine that we have seen in COVID times, but something very close to that. Okay, thank you so much, doctor. I think we're done with the questions. Um, I would like to thank Mr. George Hawat, the representing of MCO, for his attendance and support. And I also want to thank 
uh, to, uh, to uh, extend my uh, uh, gratitude for Mr. Joe Romanos, uh, the Vice President Syndicate of Optical Shops in Lebanon, and uh, Mr. Vikan, the board member in the Syndicate of Opticians at the, and Optometrists in Lebanon. I would like to thank, uh, thank you. To, I want to say thank you to all who participated today in this lecture. And uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Anurag, for sharing your expertise with us. Uh, for those who would like to watch today's lecture again or share it with others, a recording would be available on VCA's YouTube channel. Uh, I really hope you found the discussion informative and valuable. Thank you again for joining us. And stay, stay tuned for the updates on our upcoming webinars. And we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.